Welcome back to Harbour Unbox for our official Ryzen 5 1400 review. Now, I won't be going over everything Ryzen 5 for this video. This is more of an extension of the original Ryzen 5 review, which looked at the 1600X and 1500X models. I'll include a link in the video description to that video. Of course, missing from our day one review was the 1400, the most affordable CPU in the Ryzen 5 series. We also missed the cheaper 6-core 6 1600 model, but at this point I think we've pretty well established that you guys should purchase the 1600 over the 1600X, as it's pretty much the ultimate enthusiast CPU right now in terms of value. Still, if you can't afford to cough up $220 US or $300 Aussie for the 6-core champion, what's the next best thing? Well, given what we found in Monday's video, which compared the 1500X and 1400 clock for clock at 4 gigahertz, it could very well be the Ryzen 5 1400 at the more wallet-friendly $170 US or $220 Aussie. The 1500X isn't much cheaper than the 1600, and frankly, with such a small difference in price, you might as well opt for the 6-core. Also, when compared to its fellow quad-core, the cheaper 1400, that extra level 3 cache made little difference for gaming. This is particularly true for the likely scenario which would see budget shoppers pairing the 1400 with a mid-range graphics card, rather than something hideously expensive like the GTX 1080 Ti. As I said previously, at these price points, saving every dollar really helps, and while having a full 16 megabyte level 3 cache would be nice, if it's not going to net your setup any extra performance, what's the point? So I concluded that comparison by saying, if you're on a tight budget, I'd recommend picking up the 1400 rather than stretching your budget to accommodate the 1600. This is especially true for gamers. If you're going to come up with that extra $50 US, I feel you're much better off investing that money back into your GPU instead. After all, that's the difference between a GTX 1050 and RX 570, for example. What I'm yet to compare the 1400 to is the competition from Intel. For the same money, the Core i5-7400 or Core i3-7350K can be had. Already what we found when comparing these two Intel CPUs is that the quad-core Core i5 model is much more cost-effective and for the most part ends up being as fast or faster once you overclock the 7350K to something like 4.8 GHz. So essentially this is a comparison between the Ryzen 5 1400 and the Core i5-7400 then, a battle of the sub $200 US quad cores. The Core i5-7400 was tested on an Intel B250 motherboard using DDR4-2400 memory, while the Ryzen 5 1400 was paired with a B350 board using DDR4-2933 memory. Both setups do cost roughly the same amount, but the Ryzen CPU has the advantage of overclocking support, and even with the little 65 watt Wraith Stealth, can push all cores to around 3.7, possibly even 3.8 GHz. As we saw last week, investing $20 in something like the Cooler Master 212 will greatly reduce temperatures, and allow for a 4 GHz overclock, assuming you get lucky enough with that silicon lottery. Anyway, I've held you up long enough, let's get to the good stuff. First, let's check out memory bandwidth performance. Here we see the Ryzen 5 processors are good for 35 gigabytes per second using DDR4-2933 memory. This is around three gigabytes per second more than the KB Lake Core i3-7350K, which was tested using DDR3200 memory. Then we have the 7400 and G4560, which were limited to just 24 gigabytes per second with DDR4-2400 memory. Looking at raw CPU performance with Cinebench R15, we see that the 1400 is 26% faster than the i5-7400 for multi-threaded workloads, though the single thread performance was almost 10% down. When compared to the overclocked Core i3-7350K, it was interesting to see that the stock 1400 was 31% slower for the single thread performance, but was still 34% faster for the multi-threaded workloads. Not only that, but once overclocked, the 1400 was 67% faster than the 7350K in this test. Overclocking the 1400 improved performance by 25% in our Excel test, taking just 5.17 seconds to complete the workload. That meant it was 16% faster than the Core i5-7400 and 35% faster than the overclocked 7350K. Out of the box, the 1400 lays waste to anything Intel has to offer at the same price point in our 7-zip test. For decompression work, the 1400 was over 40% faster than the i5-7400 and i3-7350K. The compression margins were closer, but the 1400 was still at least 15% faster than the Intel competitors. Of course, once overclocked, the 1400 blows everything out of the water, and it is able to roughly match the overclocked 1500X. 
Now, a little bit of context before we discuss these results. The Core i7 6900K took 198 seconds, while the 7700K took 230 seconds to complete this very premier workload. So this means overclock the 1400 was just 24% slower than the 7700K. Not bad for half the price. Of course, you can still overclock the 7700K, but even with that in mind, an impressive result for the affordable AMD quoted core. Compared to the overclock 7350K, it was still 35% faster, and there is simply nothing in this price bracket from Intel that can compete with the Ryzen 5 1400. The power consumption figures are based on entire system load, and the stress figures are based on the Premier Pro CC benchmark just seen. Here the Ryzen 5 series actually looks very impressive. Out of the box, the 1400 consumes slightly more power than the Core i3-7350K, not bad given it features twice as many cores. Then overclocked, it only pushed total system consumption 12% higher than the overclocked 7350K, and given it was 35% faster in this test, that's an amazing result for AMD. Okay, time for the games. First up we have Battlefield 1, and in total there are four graphs to discuss here. Let's start with the GTX 1080 Ti results arranged by the average frame rate. Looking at the average figures, the 1400 does come in second to the 7350K in both its out-of-the-box configuration as well as the overclock configuration. It was also a good bit slower than the Core i5-7400, at least before we overclocked. However, let's arrange the graph by the all-important minimum or 0.1% frame time figures. Now the Ryzen 5 processors look much more potent. The 1400 comes in second only to the 1500X, though clock for clock at 4 GHz it's not a great deal slower. The only difference here being of course the level 3 cache capacity. Out of the box, the 1400 matched the 7400, while it was a good bit faster than the stock 7350K. Even overclocked, the 7350K couldn't catch up. Overclocked, the 1400 closes in on the 1500X, and we see a very strong 74 FPS minimum with the GTX 1080 Ti. Great stuff here for the 1400, but how do things look with a more realistic GPU? Something like the RX 480? Let's take a look, shall we? So here we have the same test, but this time the GTX 1080 Ti has been swapped out for the much more affordable RX 480. Something to note here is that for the faster CPUs tested, the frame rate only drops by a little over 30%, so the GTX 1080 Ti was clearly being limited by these mid-range CPUs, though I'm sure that won't surprise many of you. Arranging the data by the average frame rate, we see a very minor difference between the fastest and slower CPUs tested, just a 4 FPS delta. This arrangement isn't particularly flattering for the Ryzen 5 processors, and while not much slower than the Intel competitors, they are dead last at 84 FPS on average. However, if we arrange the data by the minimum frame rate, the overclocked 1500X actually matched the overclocked 7350K. Meanwhile, the overclocked 1400 easily beats the Core i5-7400 and roughly matches the much higher clocked 7350K. So where it counts the most, the minimum frame rate, the 1400 is very strong. That's one CPU intensive title down, five more to go. Testing Mafia 3 with the mighty GTX 1080 Ti, we see that the 1400 is able to match the 7350K when both CPUs are left at their stock operating frequencies. Overclocked, the 1400 does fall behind the 7350K by a slight margin, and is roughly on par with the Core i5-7400 now. Now when arranging the data by the minimum results, we see that the only real change here is between the Core i5-7400 and Ryzen 5 1400. The 1400 now actually slips behind the Intel processor, albeit by a 1fps margin. Now something really odd happens when we test with the RX 480. Here the Ryzen CPUs are able to pull ahead of the Intel parts, well ahead when looking at the minimum results, though we will get to those in a minute. Something odd happened with Mafia 3 recently, either through a game update or a change to the way the Nvidia display driver works in this title, I still haven't had time to work out what's actually going on. Previously using an Nvidia GPU, the Ryzen 7 processors crushed any and all KB Lake processors. Now with this recent change, the 7700K is actually pulled back ahead. We just saw the Ryzen 5 CPU struggling to compete with the GTX 1080 Ti, whereas now with the RX 480 they look quite dominant. If we arrange this graph by the minimum result, the Ryzen 5 processors take out the top four spots. Even stock the 1400 beats out the Core i5-7400, albeit by a single frame, while it comfortably sits ahead of the 7350K. Once overclocked, the 1400 matched the overclocked 1500X with a minimum result of 40 FPS, and this meant it was almost 30% faster than the Core i5-7400, the fastest Intel CPU tested in this game.
Ashes of the Singularity Escalation is a super CPU intensive game, and it's the only DX12 title I know of right now that can be tested using an NVIDIA GPU without completely crippling Ryzen. That said, it's still by far the best example we have of a well put together DirectX 12 title. Anyway, with the GTX 1080 Ti we find some mighty impressive results with the 1400. Before any overclocking takes place, the 1400 had no trouble knocking off the Core i5 7400 and even the overclocked Core i3 7350K. It was 6% slower than the 1500 x when matched at 4GHz, so that's the impact the larger level 3 cache has in this title. Now with the RX 480 we find similar margins, though with the GPU bottleneck creeping into the results, we are seeing the performance shape to around 70 FPS. This has resulted in a few things. Firstly, the cache difference between the 1400 and 1500X has been neutralised, and now they can be seen delivering the same performance. It has also allowed the overclock 7350K to catch up and edge out the stock 1400 by a slim margin. That said, once overclocked the 1400 did pull ahead and was able to max out the RX 480. Overall, we saw a strong showing for AMD's Ryzen 5 processors in Ashes. Hitman is another CPU intensive game, and here we see when comparing the average frame rate with the GTX 1080 Ti that the 1400 looks very competitive. Out of the box, it just beat the Core i5-7400, and once overclocked, it pulled well ahead to roughly match the overclocked Core i3-7350K. Arranging the graph by the minimum result favours the much higher clock 7350K, though again we see the overclock 1400 is able to beat the Core i5-7400 with relative ease. Testing with the RX 480 again hands an advantage to the Ryzen 5 CPUs, and now the overclock 1400 is able to slightly edge out the overclock 7350K for every performance metric. Deus Ex Mankind Divided was tested using the high quality preset, and like all other games, the 1080p resolution was used. Interestingly, the 1500X seems to max out the GTX 1080 Ti, as overclocking the CPU provided no extra performance. That's odd because we know using the same settings and hardware, the 1800X can reach 115 FPS on average, so I'm not 100% sure what's limiting the 1500X here. Anyway, out of the box, the 1400 is able to match the average frame rate of the 7350K, and that made it slightly sold in the Core i5-7400. That said, once overclocked, the 1400 blows the Intel processors out of the water. If we arrange the graph by the minimum frame rate, this really only changes the standings of our stock 1400 configuration, allowing it to leapfrog the Intel CPUs. Now with the RX 480, we see that almost all the CPUs are able to max out this mid-range GPU. In fact, the G4560 is really the only exception. That said, once again, arranging the graph by the minimum frame rate is a little more telling. Here the 1400 pulls ahead of the overclock 7350K before any overclocking for the Ryzen 5 processor even takes place. So an easy win for AMD then. Total War Warhammer is where we're going to end the benchmark session. First up we again have the GTX 1080 Ti results, and here the 1400 is able to best the 7350K. In fact, Intel's CPU is only able to come back once overclocked. The 1400 also requires some overclocking tinkering to overtake the Core i5-7400. Using the RX 480 we see similar standings, though the margins are greatly reduced thanks to the good old GPU bottleneck. It's really only my much loved Pentium G4560 that falls away a bit in this test when looking at the minimums. Well, there you have it. There really isn't any need to break down or analyze the data any closer. I think what we've seen was pretty conclusive. For productivity workloads that utilize multiple cores, the Ryzen 5 1400 easily beats the Core i5-7400, and that's before accounting for any overclocking performance. What's more, if we look at the power consumption in applications such as Premiere Pro, which we did, the 1400 is actually more fuel efficient than the Core i5-7400, given its superior performance, so that's a bit of an unexpected result, and also a very exciting result for AMD. Then when it came to gaming, the 1400 still remained in charge, especially once overclocked. CPU limited scenarios like what was seen when testing with Ashes of the Singularity using the GTX 1080 Ti, the 1400 was vastly superior even at the stock clock speeds. Meanwhile overclocked, it enjoyed commanding leads in games such as Battlefield 1, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, and Hitman for example. Even with a realistic mid-range GPU such as the RX 480, the 1400 was able to flex its muscles and demonstrate a clear performance advantage over the Core i5 processor, particularly if you focus on the minimum results. In my opinion, the Ryzen 5 1400 ensures a smoother experience for gamers, and this will become even more apparent in the future as games become more demanding on the CPU. As a locked part, the Core i5-7400 can't mask its lack of resources with high clock speeds, so it will start to fall further behind the 1400 at a more rapid rate than, say, the 7600K will. 
In any case, putting speculations regarding future performance aside, right now the Ryzen 5 1400 has already proven to be the smarter and better value choice of these two sub $200 US quad-core processors. For those wondering, I wasn't able to include temperature data for the Ryzen 5 1400 with the Ray Stealth, as I don't actually have that box cooler. AMD sent along just the chip itself, so I will have to try and get my hands on a Wraith Stealth cooler soon. Finally, I realise that there are quite a few people who are pro Ryzen, but even so, still don't like the 1400 because it is just a quad core. I get that, I really do, but it's still at least 20% cheaper than the 1600, and for most, the difference simply won't be realised, especially for gamers using a sub $300 US graphics card. My prediction is, by the time the 1400 starts to feel inadequate, there will be a better selection of upgrade choices available. It's much the same with the whole Ryzen 5 memory situation. I don't see the value in spending 50 or so dollars more on high frequency memory if it's not going to result in the added performance under realistic gaming conditions, which are almost always GPU limited. Again, in my opinion, you're better off saving your money or upgrading a component that will provide noticeable performance gains, such as the graphics card. Anyway, that's about it for this one. In summary, I think AMD's Ryzen 5 1400 is a smart choice and it will have you covered for some time to come. Of course, the beauty of the AM4 platform being that upgrading in the future will simply be a matter of dropping in a new processor, and that's it. And well, that is really it for this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again soon.